All right, cool. How long have you had the vlogging camera for? Because like, when did I actually give that to you? <laughs> it had, you had to have given me. Like stage like, three, right? Like May. Really? It's been, so are you going to have a vlogging setup for an entire year without ever producing a single vlog? Okay, look, Jane, <laughs> I need you to chill right now, okay? <laughs> I've thought Just about it. Starting out with the heavy hitting questions, yeah. you know? Yeah, I mean, I want to. I, I mean, actually... what's stopping you? Like, it doesn't have to be a good vlog. Um, what, what's, the, what's the saying that Randy always says that uh, don't let perfect get in the way of good? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's yeah. good. Yeah. The thing is, like, I, I, I've sit down and I've thought about it. Yeah. And I want to do it. There's a lot of stuff I feel like I could do that would be cool. Yeah. Um, but it's like with coaching day to day, yeah. I worry about what stuff I can and can't show. Yes. You know, and so yeah. I, I, what I really need to do is just start and then, you know, cut the bits out that yeah. I feel like are, you know. It's kind of funny. I, like show. Claire, my fiance, just went yeah. to uh, Europe for her three, right. the, the trip through Europe. And I'd been convincing her that if she's going to go on this trip, she has to document in some yeah. sort of way. So I just convinced her, I was like, you know, you should really vlog. And I was like, you know, you could get an iPhone or something. And I was like, mm -hmm. they're going yeah, to, yeah, yeah. you all could also just like keep it really simple and just, you know, can talk to your phone. But yeah. she's been doing that. And then it came out and I was talking to uh, the group that I use for my videos on mm -hmm. YouTube and Twitch, like the production crew. And everyone's kind of like, we're like, there, we can do so many things, but it's like, on the other hand, what we really care about is just the person yeah, on camera yeah. sharing a story. Like, the production quality is nice, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's still yeah. you. You're the reason yeah. that people would watch it, anything mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, there, there was one day where, like, I walked outside, I was like, I could start today. And I grabbed my phone and I recorded, like, a, yeah. hey, I'm just going to start. And then I just... You just didn't? Just didn't. You just got to fucking yeet it onto the internet yeah. at some point. Yeah. And see how it goes from there. I mean, you yeah. even have a YouTube channel. And when you were streaming on Twitch, you had like 500, 800 viewers, didn't you? Uh, sometimes. Yeah. When you'd host me. Yeah. Well. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. It's. I want to see how the community like takes the coaching content more yeah. from like, um, a, with actively being like the head coach. Yeah. You know, and focusing more on that rather than like on content. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm curious how, you know. That's how something that I've been actually that. thinking about recently that I haven't found an answer mm -hmm. to. So, like, a lot of my content is educational. Mm -hmm. And then um, the weird thing is that whenever I'm consuming content or anything like that or doing something to work, I never ever want to kind of um, produce content or consume content in the same category. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like, it's, it's a bit of an overload. Is it out of... When you're interested in putting out coaching content, is that something that you actually want to do or you just think that, like, people would like it and do you even want to engage with the community yeah because they haven't I exactly mean, been nice to you yeah them I mean, they haven't it definitely is in waves like yeah. sometimes it's really positive sometimes it's really negative um but honestly like i i don't actually consume much of the educational content anymore yeah um i think that's mostly because i'm doing that every day yeah you know so i, I you know there's a lot of up and coming like coaches and stuff that if i want to see their thoughts on stuff i'll, yeah. I'll look at who's it, one but, of the upcoming coaches that you've been keeping um, an eye on? Well, right now I haven't because I've, I've like relocked in my coaching staff and I just like, you know, I, I'm happy with what we have yeah. and you know, we're moving forward. So who are the, who are the new additions to the coaching staff? Yeah. So, well, so we when you know, you, you moved to content and then Damon moved on and then we have, we all, all we added was Young. Yeah. And so Young was with Element Mystic. Mm -hmm. um, and he has a very like specific style that he does with coaching, which I think actually fits uh, the way that we're structuring the staff this year. Yeah. Um, to so where before we get into that style of coaching, Young has been with one of the players for three years now? Doha. Doha. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, Doha was like on our list of like players we're looking at, you yeah. know, but we didn't really push into looking at all of Doha's stuff until Young was like, look, I know this guy, you should look at him. Yeah. And so um, I looked at Doha, like completely separate from Young, and, and decided like, you know, this is this is a kid that, has a lot of potential, yeah. a lot of stuff. And then <clears throat> Young told me about his role with an element mystic, and he was, you know, one of the big communicators and plan makers and that kind of stuff, which is, you know, one of the things that we were looking at adapting in the team anyway. And so, you know, we gave him a shot, and it, you know, so far it's been going really good. I really like Doha, and Young, Young's coaching style in general, I think, is really interesting, because it's, it's, you know, I have him as the strategy. Like a strategy coach is you know kind of a general broad term, mm -hmm. um, but really it's um, he and I work together on deciding a lot of the strategies, and then yeah. he's very much looking at um, you know team wide mistakes and like things we can do better. Uh, we were actually talking about it the other day. He's like, I don't like looking at big problem like big mis big mistakes, big no. general ideas. He like because 
big mistakes are basic mistakes plus basic mistakes plus basic mistakes. Oh, like the Swiss cheese model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just compounding errors. Yeah, so you know, one of the things that we do is we've we've spent a lot more time in review, and, and we kind of structure the way we do review different this year too. So um, it's it's a lot more review in a lot shorter chunks. Mm -hmm. uh, we we do occasionally do like a long one um, at, at the end of the day, but we do a lot more like you know right after the scrim, we'll we'll jump in for fifteen minutes and talk about stuff and and that kind of thing. And Yong style fits that perfectly. So I'm really, I'm really happy. I think Young, I, like I can't, I want to brag on Young a lot because he's very, new. He's, he's new in Overwatch League and a lot yeah. of people didn't know him from Element Mystic because, you know, most people know Rush and Sparkle, but not Young and Doha. Mm -hmm. um, and Young had, had a, a very big impact on Element Mystic and he's such a smart dude and funny dude. Like I, he's, he's a star. And he, how's his he's English? He's perfectly bilingual? Uh, not perfectly. No. Um, he started learning English like more seriously about six months ago. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, I, I can talk to him fine. Yeah. So I mean, he's already, you know, doing really well with it. And, you know, one of our things is even though we have like four Korean players on the team, two Korean coaches on the team, we all agreed like English is, is the primary. Yeah. And so all the players are working hard on taking English lessons and using English. Um, and it's, it's a lot of work for them, but they want to do it because mm -hmm. in their own words, I didn't make them say this. They said, English is the future, like for esports. If we get into the Western scene, like our careers will be way easier. That's so crazy that they think yeah. that the Western, like North America, is the future yeah. of esports when everyone in North America is like Chinese mobile gaming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. <laughs> it's yeah, kind of well, crazy. Everybody thinks the grass is greener yeah, yeah. somewhere else. I, I think it's the idea that there's more money oh, well, like, being poured into true. the yeah. you know North American yeah. scene, so that you know they want to be able to make more money in the future. So being bilingual is way easier yeah. to do that. So. Which one of the players has the best English and the worst English? Who's struggling? Of the Korean players? Yeah, of the Korean players. Well, you know. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I, I, I guess. I, guess <laughs> I mean. But I know Unko speaks pretty good English. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, our European players speak English. His English is perfect. Yeah, I speak English perfect. Um, I, the best one is, is Gamsu, yeah. I'd say. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, that, that, he's been working in esports and North America for years, dating back into league when he was with, you know, mm -hmm. Dignitas and, and, and Fnatic, I think, before that. Um, but I think Doha is the newest to English. Like Closer was with us last year and Decay yeah. was with Gladiator, so he had some experience. Um, Doha is the newest. And um, he's working really hard as well. I mean, I see him in English, English classes all the time. Like if we have uh, more than like an hour break, a lot of times they'll jump on and do English lessons in between really? streams. And, yeah. Wow. Um, so yeah, Doha has been working on it super hard, um, but yeah, I'd say Gams is probably the best. So going back to the uh, the coaching structure. So yeah. last year, at least from my own personal experience, we had the uh, positional coaches mm -hmm. primarily, and then Damon with strategy as well. Yeah. Uh, now that was kind of the first implementation of quite an ambitious staff and yeah, coaching yeah. style. Um, what are the other changes that you've made, not only in personnel but kind of in the coaching structure yeah. of the fuel going into S two? Yeah, well, I think the positional coach idea, in theory, um, is interesting, um, it has potential, but we felt like, and you know, with every, all the coaches' feedback, we felt like it was too restrictive. Mm -hmm. You know, the roles intermingle so much that, you know, being just po focused on tanks isn't, you know, is only like a tiny piece of what you're actually coaching, you know. So we, instead of doing positional coaches, it's just like individual coaches or player coaches is kind of the idea. Um, so Ticket and Vulgen are taking on the players specifically. Mm -hmm. So their role during the scrims is like they're going to be specking players individually, looking at what, how they do things, what things are they communicating, how are they using their cooldowns, all that kind of stuff. And a lot of that is just general stuff that coaching entails anyway. Yeah. So Yang and I will look at that, of course, too. But um, they're more um, specific to like this player, your goals are X, Y, Z. Let's work on them today. Um, and then so m my... What I end up doing is, is being more like, all right, as a team, we're working on this, this, this. We have this comp we're working on. You know, let's, let's push this communication style, this tempo, whatever. And then Yang is, is going back and reviewing to see how we did it. Did we do it correctly? What things can we improve on? That kind of thing. Um, so it's a little different. Last year, you know, the, the positional coaches, like I said, it felt just a little too restrictive. We mm -hmm. wanted to give more freedom for the coaches to be able to talk to any player. Like, of course, like... I don't want it to sound like, you know, the tank coach couldn't talk to the DPS, you know. Yeah. But there was always that fear like you're crossing lines like into the other. It was respect. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so we wanted to kind of break those, break those barriers, not let that happen um, to where the coaches have that creative freedom. And so <clears throat> with that, it means that the coaches are meeting a lot more 
to talk about you know everything we're talking to each player about and everything so we're all on the same page and we're all in agreement on what we want to work on so mm -hmm. I've seen uh, I've stopped in on a few of the review sessions that you've mm -hmm. been talking about and uh, um, a lot of the work is being done through well not a lot of the work but some of the work is being done through a translator yeah. um, because again with the uh, English not being a strong language for mm -hmm. some of the individuals so far. How's the how's the kind of communication working both during the actual practice matches right now? You haven't done yeah. any officials yet, uh, as well as kind of in the review sessions. Yeah. Um, so we we ended up um, bringing on a translator. Her, uh, her tag is Dear. Yeah. Um, the idea was we don't want her to be a crutch um, for either the mainly English speaking players or the mainly Korean speaking players. Yes. Because we want to break those barriers. So she's there for if there's something very specific that someone can't communicate or doesn't know how to communicate, mm -hmm. um, you know, that way we can just be a little more specific. My goal with the players this season is um, I, I want players to be able to talk more to each other, like more freely to each other. Um, last year, it, I felt like, close, like Closer was a great example. I felt like he didn't really get to express all the things he wanted to say yeah. because he, you know, I mean, he's a smart kid. He's too. a very, he's a very he's smart kid, smart. but like, there's a lot of things he just didn't know how to say, or it took a while for him to get his thoughts across, and yeah. so um, he would get discouraged sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I don't want that to happen again. Yeah. So we got uh, Helen for now. Like, like the the goal is, you know, she's there to help for the really detailed things. Yeah. Um, but in game, it's all English, and everyone's, you know. The, when the game's going on, a lot of the callouts and stuff, it's, it's pretty universal. Like if you were to say Zarya, no E, like everyone knows what you're talking about. Yeah. You know? um, <clears throat> so for the most part, it's, it's mostly, it, pretty much entirely English. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it does mean though that a lot of review sessions and stuff take a little longer because we, I want people to be able to express their opinions and mm -hmm. having to go through, you know, another, a third party to do that just takes a little longer. But everyone understands yeah. and agrees like it's important. So, you know. One of the interesting things that I found last year, um, and I'm not even sure if this is like a fuel specific thing sure. or just with the players we had, but uh, one of the main sources kind of conflict from last year was that the French players and the Western players, um, they were constantly looking to iterate kind of strategy, tactics, composition, whereas the Korean players really had the philosophy about uh, increasing their own personal execution yeah. mechanics. Is that philosophy still kind of split? Is that something you find as like a general case between Korean or North American philosophy? Is there a split mm -hmm. in philosophy between the two kind of cultures? Uh, I, I know what you mean. Um, there definitely are some, I don't think it's necessarily um, region specific or cult, maybe it's cultural, but I think it's more individual mm -hmm. where some players want to think more broad and some players want to think more specific. Yep. Um, and so part of what we're doing is being able to address both. So a lot of our sessions are to address both. That way we don't have like, if we're talking about individual stuff, players don't feel like we're ignoring the big stuff. Mm -hmm. Or if we're talking about the big stuff, we're ignoring the little stuff. Um, so we, you know, that's why the why we do so many reviews yeah why we take the time after scrims like immediately after the scrim it's about the broad stuff so yeah. it's like okay well maybe we should have pushed left or done this rotation or use this old combo whatever and then when we're doing the reviews after at the end of the day the longer ones are more like you know we messed up this cooldown we should have you know used our may wall in this way and pushed this way um, <clears throat> so it's a little more individual after the whole day yeah and then you know, right after the scrim, the five, 10, 15 minute little, little review chunks that we do is just talking about the map and talking about the broad stuff. So the goal is for both things to be addressed. Yeah. That's why we do it this way. And we don't have one kind of dominant philosophy right now. It is Not trying right to seek that balance between, yeah. the, you know, the big, you were talking about, you know, Young wants to focus on those. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why, things. yeah. And so that's why we give him that time, like at the end, to be able to focus on the basic mistakes, basic mistakes. And then all the players that want to talk about the general stuff, we use that the little five, 10, 15 minute chunks. And that's something that I actually, um, like I really took on that philosophy after working with Team USA this year. Yeah. Um, because <clears throat> going into Team USA, I grabbed a couple of US coaches just to help me out because doing it all on your own is, is a lot of work. And when you already, when it's your only off time, you don't want to be doing, you know, yeah. 24 hours for another month straight, so. Um, but I brought on Junk Buck and Harsha. And one of the things I really liked that Chunk Buck did was those 10 minutes after. It's like, I kind of used him to do a lot of the strategy, um, kind of like how I structured it now, where he's like the young. But after we would do a, a scrim, we would 
gather the players and just talk 10 minutes, 50 minutes yeah. um, about the stuff we were doing. And I really liked that idea, the way that the players responded to it and everything, um, to where you have the extra time where you can do the, the minute stuff and detailed stuff, but you have dedicated time for the broad stuff. And I really liked that concept, which is why we adapted it into Fuel now. So that's what you learned from Junk Bunk. Did you learn anything from Harsha? Um, so Harsha, his coaching style is very personal. Yeah. So he's, he's very good at building relationships with players and talking to them individually and, and helping them more on an individual level. Mm -hmm. um, and he's really good at that, so, um, which is also kind of more what I do. You know, yeah. I, mean, I do some of the broad stuff, of course, but uh, we have similar styles. So you know, it was kind of just seeing both coaching styles um, was a little more interesting. Yes. Um, so you know, I, I actually am really excited to see how Harsha does with Outlaws this year. I'm good friends with Harsha. Um, and so I think that um, with his style being a head coach now, mm -hmm. I think he'll, you know, he'll be able to build something pretty good there. So, sticking on with the uh, the Team USA train there, sure. um, let's talk first about kind of the politics of going into Team USA this year. So, oh yeah. So not uh, this past year, but the year before that, Team USA didn't have a good showing. Went mm -hmm. on the quarters yeah. after being pretty hyped up. Um, so coming into this year, you got selected again, much to the chagrin of the general <laughs> public community. Um, yeah, starting from kind of, what was your thought process going into wanting to run again to be the head coach, and then after you were selected again to yeah. be Team USA's head coach, where did things go from there? Yeah, so when, when uh, World Cup got announced, I wasn't even sure World Cup was going to happen yeah, this year. I don't think I mean, there, was. there were a lot of rumors yeah. that it wasn't going to happen. Um, so I just hadn't really thought about it. <clears throat> but when it got announced it was happening, and I threw my name in the general, like, um, they do two different voting sessions for the coaches. It's like one is just if you get endorsed, and then it's the actual voting in. So I threw my name in the endorsement because that's easy. I was like, I'll think about it during this time. And I originally wasn't going to do it. Yeah. Like, why not? Part of me was like, when we went through what we went through, last year after yeah. UK, that was a, a really hard time. Yeah, I mean, when, when you go out like that, um, I learned a lot about um, how to handle, you know, how to handle the fans, but also how to handle your own presence and everything. I learned a lot from that. And so I wasn't sure, I was 50-50 on it. Like, I didn't know if I would win because of how it went last year. But um, it was actually at the homestand. I was talking to the couple players that were on Team USA last year. Mm -hmm. um, because they had a, they attended the homestand as well, and it was some. I think it was the like there was like this big event beforehand. It was like Top Golf, all everyone was yeah. there, whatever. And I was talking to a few of them, and they said like, you know, even though it happened, I think universally the players still agree. Like, you know, you're still the coach that they would want this year um, compared to all the other U.S. coaches. And that was a little reassuring, you know. Did they say why they preferred you over the other candidates? We're going to plead the fifth on that one? We'll plead the fifth on that one. I, <laughs> you know, I, I don't think that there's bad coaches in the U.S. There's definitely yeah. good ones. Um, but the coach vote is entirely players. It's the top, what's the top 250 players or something? 150. The top 150 yeah. players are the ones that vote them in. And, you know, I think I just have more of a reputation than the other coaches. And having, knowing a lot of the tier two players and tier one players just from my, my history in Overwatch. I think a lot of players just know yeah. more about me. Yeah. And the only, the only team that I haven't like placed in like the top, like maybe top three in a tournament in is is, is Fuel. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at my history, it's like, you know, I have a pretty good record in terms of a lot of the teams and stuff I've coached. Um, so <clears throat> outside of the Team USA last year and and the Fuel season, that was, um, yeah. You know, I mean, at the at the time when the coach wedding was going on, it was. You know, we had stage four of season one, stage one of season two, and stage two of season two. So my, the, at the time, our record was, my record with Fuel was pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, and so. If you were to summarize kind of why Fuel's not a top three, te top three team, or at least wasn't last year, and as simple as possible, only pick one thing, one of the largest zoomed out hashtag that you could describe, mm -hmm. why things didn't go the way you wanted last year. First thing that springs to mind. I would say, Chuck, I would say miscommunication. Miscommunication. Yeah. Do you want to expand on that or just leave that one to the... We, I, I think we can expand on it later. Okay. But I want to finish the Team USA. Okay, keep going. Quick. Yeah. Um, 
so I, I decided to put my name in the hat after talking to those players. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the, the way that you have to build the Team USA roster or any World Cup roster was so weird <laughs> because it's, it, we're in the middle of stage three in which I have to start thinking about how I'm going to do tryouts. Do I do tryouts with streamers? Do I do open tryouts? USA in general has a lot of players in the top, you know, yeah. top echelon of Overwatch. I mean, it's like South Korea and US and China, I think, are the big ones that have the most players. So you go through, do I really want to go through open tryouts with all these players? And we talked about it with, the, with um, Anna Lynn. She was the general manager this year. Yeah. And then I had already decided on Junkbuck and Harsh as assistant coaches. We talked about it and decided open tryouts probably isn't the easiest thing to do because all of us are you know, in the middle of an Overwatch League season. And you know, there's, we already have an idea of who the top like 25 players probably are. So we decided to invite, I think we invited... 30 players, I think something like that, mm -hmm. and did internal tryouts and swapped a bunch of players on the teams every week and just wanted to see um, synergies and stuff. What it really came down to at the end was there's like a core of like shock players, a core of like Atlanta players, you have some Houston players mixed in, um, and then a few players from other teams kind of mixed in. And going into stage four was when we were finalizing that. Mm -hmm. And so I decided like after watching it all, like Sinatra, Moth, and Super, this core, this shock core, um, made so much sense. You know, like their just their mindsets, their attitudes. I know that, you know, Sinatra and my, everyone from Team USA the year before learned a lot about, um, you know, how to handle certain teams. Because I still believe that that team, that even though we went out in quarters, was still one of the best teams. Yeah. I mean, just from. Like how we were performing was incredible, but we didn't really prep for UK. I think we, we very much underestimated them and we didn't adapt to their style in time. And so we could have beaten them, I think, had we prepped properly. You know, so maybe that's my fault, maybe that's the team's fault, whatever. We can talk about that another day. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I knew that these guys were hungry. They were doing really well in the season. I mean, Shock had a you know, golden stage. I mean, they were doing really well. Stage three, they still were doing really well. Atlanta was on the rise, but like I still felt like Shock was the right way to go. Um, these the, that core players, and then you know, of course, Space Corey, um, KSF added on to that, and Rock is. So there was there's definitely a lot of weird politics with with World Cup. Yeah. A lot of things that people probably don't realize. There's a ton of politics. There's a lot of politics. You know, there's. I remember at one point I had a couple of org owners reach out to me and say, I know you're a coach for Fuel, I, go, I don't want you poaching my players. I had that come up, I had stuff with Blizzard come up that's like, you know, telling me we have to do all these sponsor obligations, but not, our players don't get anything out of it. You know, there, there's just a lot of just general yeah, there's stuff a lot of that you have to deal with, you know. Yeah. And being the US team, BlizzCon, BlizzCon, it's a home crowd, you know, there's just a lot of stuff that the US team has to do, that's required to do. Um, we, I mean, we do get the advantage of it being a home, home field, so that's always nuts, you know, when you walk in the, the actual arena and it's a vastly U.S. crowd, um, it's something I'll never forget, you know, it's a really cool experience, but there definitely is a lot of politics and weird stuff, you kind of hoops you have to jump through and, and mm -hmm. deal with, but, you know, it's a learning experience. It was something to do in the offseason. The way, the way I looked at it last year was, um, since we had already decided it was end of, end of the season, you know, I knew that um, World Cup would, World Cup stuff would pick up in about a month after the season end, a month or two after the season end, yeah. for us, at least our season. Um, I wanted to just take it as a learning opportunity, try a new structure, try um, to learn from, you know, the players, you know, learn from Drunk Buck and Harsha. You know, I'm, I, one of my philosophies I've always had is even if it's, um, something that's not, even if the person isn't that great at their job, there's always something you can learn. Mm -hmm. There's always something you can learn. Even if I'm the better coach, there's always something I can learn. Um, and so, you know, I just try to go in as a student and learn as much as I can from everybody, pick the parts I want to, you know, use in my own coaching, my own team, my own structure, um, and move on. So with USA, I just tried to do that. Keep a mindset of like, we're all growing, we're all learning, we can all you know, we can do this. And when we, when we got into scrims and things were going well, I had a really good feeling about it. But I know everyone 
we had that same feeling the previous year. Yeah. It's like, we're a really good team, but this year we made sure like, we're not taking any chances. So we're gonna you know, look at every mistake, we're gonna talk about every comp, we're gonna try to be adaptable, we're not gonna underestimate anybody. You know, even when we were in the group stages, there was a couple teams that, you know, realistically weren't very good. We still took the time to watch, you know, watch their VODs, think about their strengths, talk about all the comp, you know, comp composition options they had to run. So, yeah, I mean, and I, I'm trying to take that mindset into fuel this year, where even if scrims are going well, if scrims are going bad, whatever, like we're always learning, we're always growing, and we're never underestimate anybody. And I think it's easy, especially for Western players. Western players have egos, and it's the <laughs> funniest thing. It's the funniest thing. You know, I, I just want to make sure that any team I'm in now, like, egos are out the door. So this, uh, this reminds me, you've got a poster now. Mm -hmm. It's a very nicely printed, professionally posted or printed poster, and it's been signed by all the players, yeah. and it's a, it's a list of philosophies, or what do you call it? Yeah, so it's a pyramid. It's, it's a, a pyramid. Pyramid of success. Pyramid, call okay, it. tell me about the pyramid yeah. of success, because it's, it's hanging prominently in the practice yeah. facility, and it's signed yeah. in permanent marker by all of the players. Yeah. And this was not there last year, so tell, yeah. me, tell me about the evolution of this pyramid of yeah. success. Yeah, so one of the things I do is every week I try to listen to some prominent coach or analyst or something in any field. So one of the ones I, was lo I looked into and found was uh, TCU has this football program that's pretty good. That's um, Texas Christian University? Yeah, so they're actually in Texas here, yes. obviously. They're, yep. they're pretty close. Um, and they have this pyramid. <clears throat> and so I basically stole the idea completely and, and turned it into like an eSports version. My, I took, put my spin on it, you know. You but were inspired they, by. Inspired by TCU, yeah. Um, so basically um, the idea is uh, it's a pyramid. So at the top is our goal for the season, which is win Overwatch League. I mean, that's, you know, I think everybody's goal for the season. You want to right? win Overwatch League. Is yeah, that, is that a symbolic goal or is that a realistic one in your mind? I think it's realistic. Okay. If it was just symbolic, then I just don't know. Checking. Just checking. Yeah, it's very realistic. So, but the important pieces are at the bottom. So the bottom is the foundation and that is our core values. So we have a core values that we believe as a team is like the things we need to hold to. And then right above that is the daily disciplines. So we have the general core values and then the things we agree to do on a daily basis. So the things like, you know, we even as small as staying focused in scrims or giving 100% effort, a, a bunch of stuff is in there. So it's um, our foundation. And then right above that is our goals for the season. So we start at little goals. Let's win again, win our matches at home. So mm -hmm. we have like teams we're playing at home, win matches on the road, win the West Division, whatever. And as far as we get, we'll, we'll mark them off with everything that we accomplish. Who knows, you know, maybe we'll only mark off a couple things. Maybe we'll, you know, be able to mark off the whole pyramid, who knows. But the idea is, in order for us to reach the top, we have to work on the foundation stuff. And that is all of those things. Just like I talked about with the, the Team USA stuff and like egos and all that kind of, you know, it's like we have to take every match seriously every game seriously, mm -hmm. every minute of scrims is so important, especially this year with travel. I mean, teams are gonna get like maybe 60% of the amount of scrims they got before, you just with the nature of travel. While. So every scrim is so important. Yeah. And that's not even adding the idea of hero pools that just got dropped on us. You know, like every, we'll every scrim, every scrim is so important. So, you know, my thing, I told them like, if you wanna be part of this team, prove it. You know, and I handed them a Sharpie if they wanted to do it, they had to sign it. If they wanted to enter the practice room the next day, they had to sign it. And everyone wants to do it. Everyone agrees with it. Part of it was stuff that, you know, the players talked about wanting to do and wanting to be a part of. And so we put it on a poster. It's up. And, you know, it's as, we, pretty cool. I like it. as we go through the season, we'll mark off the things we accomplish. So famously in the season one, uh, San Francisco Shock mm -hmm. uh, kind of said that they were preparing for the next season or the future. And then um, they ended up doing it. Is your goal at the very top of win Overwatch League? Is that a this year goal? Is that a, a three year goal? What kind of time frame do you think it's going to take you to climb the entire pyramid? Um, well, I I'm going to make it a this year goal because even though like we are building for the future, I think you can have both concepts in mind. Yeah. You know, even like, even if what we want to look like two years from now may be completely different from what we'll look like one year from now, I think we can still shoot for you know, the win Overwatch League goal. I mean, there's mm -hmm. no reason not to. 
Um, so with, our, with the way the team is right now, I'm really happy with where we're at right now. Um, and I think we've been, we've been improving a lot. And it's a very different style of team. I, like, I, I can't wait to actually play because it's very different from season two, very different from season one. Um, our, our play style is very different. And it, I think it is a realistic goal for this season. Um, but at the same time, you know, I always have the future, you know, goals planned for future, goals planned short-term, long-term goals. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we'll see. Uh, so let's draw the line between Team USA to the start of, well, basically where we are now. Because mm-hmm. the first homestand starts in about a week. Yeah. By the time this is released, it'll probably be a day or two before the mm-hmm. actual homestand kicks off. Um, so let's talk about the offseason then. Yeah. First off, starting right away. Uh, what was the reaction after Team USA won? Was it kind of like, hooray, happiness, celebration, or was it like, relief, we did what we were expected to, kind of like, congratulations, you're not a disappointment. Yeah. What was the reaction after you won Team USA? Um, I think the reaction was just, we were just excited. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, just happy that we won. We kind of placed the expectation on ourselves to win, but at the same time, like, beating Korea in general is a hard task. And so that was, you know, everyone, even if we didn't win first, I think there would have still been a little happiness that we were able to come, you know, mm-hmm. we would have came top two. But winning, I think everyone, you know, felt, there were a lot of players there that felt validated. You know, I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, how good is Space, how good is Corey, you know, players like those who have, they didn't, they didn't win Overwatch League yet, you know, but they're good players and people talk about as good players. So them being able to win on Team USA, I think, you know, definitely boosted their confidence. And one of the things I always I have about every every player that I've coached, whether it's Team USA before Dallas Fuel, Dallas Fuel is, um, you know, I, I always want any player I coach to like to be successful. You know, I, I, I try to keep in contact with them as, as many of them as I can, without crossing boundaries, um, and I, I think that it boosted like a lot of those players' confidence. And so the excitement of being able to win and prove themselves on that stage, um, I think will help them carry over into Overwatch League, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so similarly for me, um, you know, I, it was at a time where, you know, we ended the season pretty poorly on Dallas. And then Team USA the year before ended pretty poorly. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you always have that thing in the back of your mind, like, you know, is it a fluke that I did so well beforehand? Like, what's going on? Is it an on? imposter syndrome, right? Yeah. It's like, mm-hmm. do I actually deserve to be here? Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think, you know, winning Team USA definitely, you know, helped that a bit. I mean, I, I, I'm always very confident in myself, and I believe that I'm a good coach. Hmm. Um, but it, that definitely, you know, helps the validation of coaching. You know, that, yeah. you know my philosophies are, are not crazy. Do you have an answer for people who say that you got carried by the skill of the players on Team USA? <laughs> I mean, they, most fans have no idea what a coach actually does. Oh, yeah, zero clue. Zero idea what a coach actually does. So, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I'll let the fans have opinions or, let, you know, let people have opinions. and Everyone's entitled to their own. So, yeah. you know, that's just how I view it. Okay, so after Team USA, yeah. that puts us in the long period at the end of uh, last mm-hmm. year. So the main kind of task there would have been updating the roster, yeah. player contract negotiations. Yeah, well, so updating the roster was actually happening every day at, in the during middle of it. during Team USA. Oh, yeah, I, mean, okay. I remember, um, you know, after Team USA scrims, we were in boot, we were boot camping, you know, three blocks a day, reviewing before, in the middle, after, like you're talking 10 hour days. Mm-hmm. And in the middle, like any break I got, I'd, I'd step away, I'd be calling a player, I'd be in a meeting, I'd be talking to Stro oh, or goodness. talking to Tasmo, you know, I mean, it was, it was long days, but you know, fuel ultimately is my number one priority. And so, and we wanted to make sure that the changes we wanted to make, you know, we could. So it was, it was a lot of work, but you know, we had been planning it since the season ended. Since season two ended, it was, even before, it was, you know, how are we gonna update? How are we gonna adapt? What things do we wanna change? So some of that time is reflecting on what things we felt like we did poorly or did well, what do we wanna change? How do we wanna adapt um, our structure, our, our staff, our players, everything. Can you um, talk a little bit more specifics about like the main things you wanted to change, or did you have like a goal or philosophy in mind in updating the roster? Yeah. Um, so the first thing, first thing I wanted to do was update how we structured the coaching staff, which is we kind of talked about that a little yep. bit already. Um, and so that was the very first thing because I wanted to get rid of the positional coach idea. I I still think it's a potential thing in the future, but maybe not right the second. Let's just structure it 
this way, which is you know a little more freedom for coaches to to do um, to work with you know players, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so that was the first step, and I had been talking to a bunch of coaches. I was looking through some educational content. You, know, you had there's a bunch of coaches that joined the league from contenders, or you mm -hmm. know whether they were making content or not. Um, and so I was looking through coaches, but also um, with the players. I think one of the biggest things was I wanted leadership on stage. I wanted more positivity and openness in communicating about how they feel about our strategies or how they, you know, being able to address things with other players. I wanted players to be able to, to talk to each other more and I wanted to encourage that. Um, so, <clears throat> so when we were looking for these players, you know, we, when we had the opportunity uh, to sign Gamsu, um, you know, after talking to him, it, it made a lot of sense. I mean, the guy's in a, a very emotion. He's a, he's a leader, like emotional leader is, is the key. You know, when if I'm confident that if we're in match and, a, and some other player is struggling, he's going to be able to help them like recover. Yeah. Because when you're in match on stage, I can't talk to them. No. I mean, coaches cannot talk to them unless it's in between maps. Like during a break, we get like, you know, two minutes to talk to them on stage. And, and, you know, you have to try to make that as impactful as possible. So I wanted to have more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like more mental fortitude, leader kind of aspect in the team. I kind of, when I was doing Team Canada stuff, Banny was always that player for me. I always mm -hmm. kind of kind of considered him as my surrogate yeah. when uh, the match was going on, when I couldn't talk to the players or anything mm -hmm. like that. As long, you know, there was times when you talk to the whole team and then yeah, yeah. for me, I talked specifically to Banny at kind of like another level of depth about kind of if this, then that sort yeah. of thing. And that like Banny was the person that I really trusted to be able to communicate intent and keep mm -hmm. the team focused on yeah. that thing. Like having that individual, at least from a coaching perspective, made me feel a lot more comfortable kind of letting the children go as you know, right? <laughs> yeah. It's kind of, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and um, I know a lot of fans were concerned because Notes contract w was up and it was public yeah. that it was up. But yeah. um, I mean, you know, I, I think I have a lot of respect for Note and his, uh, what he brings to the team. So, you know, having Note and the opportunity of Gamsu, it just made a lot of sense to, yeah. to, to pair the two. Is I mean, it was what I was looking for. Is the pre-existing synergy there as hyped up as it is to be, or is it <laughs> Gamsu and Note are friendly with everybody, so they're friendly with each other? Um, they definitely are, are have their own synergy. Yeah. I um, mean, it is there. Um, there is a lot of, um, they already understand a lot of, like, it, there's little ticks that every player has, mm -hmm. and they already understand that yeah. about each other. And they're also very friendly with each other. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I think one of the important things about, you know, I was talking about positivity in players, is I want players to be friends. I want them to be able to talk to each other about stuff. If, if something goes wrong, or that someone, they feel like another teammate did something that, you know, was bad or whatever, but I want players to be able to talk about it, no one get offended, or, you know, people feel comfortable talking about it, and no one games already have that. Um, and so it made a lot of sense to pair them. And then, you know, we, with Trill, I mean, Trill, you know Trill, he's very, he's a positive dude. You know, I'm very open about stuff, so, you know, we felt like the tank line feels pretty good there um, with that. And then we added, we ended up adding, you know, we traded for Decay. Decay, of course, is a very mechanically gifted player. Yeah. I mean, the, the kid is insane. Yes. Um, just watching scrims, you know, it's like, holy cow, this guy's nuts. I watched uh, just a couple of scrims and just seeing... Mm -hmm. You know, there'd be fights where it'd be kind of just like, ah, uh, in a stalemate or mm -hmm. thing might be go poorly. And then it's just like, Decay killed, Decay killed. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, yeah. thanks, Decay. There's, there's, <laughs> Hashtag thanks, Decay. Yeah. <laughs> like, there, there's already been a few where, like, we wanted to try some style or some play. Yeah. And it went completely wrong. But Decay killed five people, just like on Widow or something. Yeah. And it's like, okay, we won the fight. It's like, let's talk about but, that. <laughs> but, you we know. Won. But, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and and he's, he's an incredible player. And I think that um, with the way that we built our coaching staff with Young, with, with yeah. having, having Deer here, um, and you know, players like Gamsu and Closer yeah. are both very positive, I think that it really opens up Decay to be able to mm -hmm. talk about a lot of those things. Because so I think normally he's, he's kind of quiet. Yeah. Um, but when we're able to really get his thoughts out, um, I think that it really helps him shine more so i'm really excited to see how he does on stage with the team i mean he's an incredible player yeah and then doha one of the things about doha 
I already talked about how he had like he has these leadership qualities about yeah. calling plays and, and stuff like that. But he's actually a very like funny, positive kid. And <clears throat> he's he I don't know how to explain him. Like he's he's so unique and I really love what he brings to the team. And when you add that to, uh, you know, our, our DPS line now is Zach, uh, AKM, Doha, Decay. So um, kind of different kind of silly. I don't know how to explain it. It's, mm -hmm. it's like he's his own, like, unique personality that I really think fits well with the team. Um, and he, he talks a lot and reviews a lot his own play. How can he, you know, what can he do better? Um, and he's super open to criticism. Like, if, if you have something you want to talk about, he's like, yeah, yeah. Like, I messed that up or whatever. Um, and I think it fits well with the team that we already had. Um, you know, a AKM right now is, uh, he's a, kind of the, take, trying to take on that veteran role where he wants to help the newer players, you know, get used to the stage and get used to, you know, Overwatch League and not just contenders or, you know, for example, him with Doha. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and then looking at our support lineup. So at this point, crimzo has been announced. Um, if not, it is now. If not, it is now. Um, Crimzo has been on Envy for a while. Yeah, a long time. Now. And I think we've always talked about, you know, Crimzo uh, just in general being a great player. Yeah, but we I mean, yeah, always had uh, Unko. There was no. <laughs> yeah, <it's laughs> he was kind of stumbled. I'm always amazed that he didn't get uh, yoinked by another Overwatch yeah. League team. I mean, I, I know that he had uh, he had offers, and for whatever reason, decided it wasn't the right fit for him, or yeah. you know, maybe the offer wasn't enough. I don't know. I haven't talked to him about that part, but. Um, this year, with just the structure of the league, I wanted to make sure there was another person um, that could like genuinely start in that role and still provide in that role um, outside of just Anko. Mm -hmm. like, I think bringing on another player in that role does a few things. Number one, it creates competition in the role, which is always good. It's healthy competition. They're, they'll, you know, they're both going to push each other to be better. Yeah, um, which is really good. And Crimzo in general is a super silly dude. Yeah, yes he is. <laughs> but yeah, he, yes he is. He's really positive and yeah. adaptable too, um, which is really cool. So like I've, I already like threw him in on a comp he's never played before, and was like, all right, yeah. go. He's you got know? he's got a fun style. When when something goes wrong, he'll make a joke, but he'll make yeah. a joke about the thing that went wrong, yeah. so that you have to pay attention to it. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, that's he's, good stuff. Yeah, Crim Crimzo is great. I'm really excited to have him on the team. Um, I, there, we already have plans to use both of them in different styles and different ways. So mm -hmm. um, I think he's going he's gonna to fit in well. He already has fit in well. Yeah. And then, you know, we have Harry Hook and Closer. And it allows, one of the pressures we had on Harry Hook, last year he was kind of the dedicated sub. And he's, he's, he is this year um, as well. Um, but last year he had to be able to be a sub for both roles. Yes. Um, which, I know that was challenging for which him. Which is challenging. It's, it's, it takes a certain kind of player to be able to do that. And Harry is super adaptable. I mean, he played, he was a Lucio player that played Soldier and Apex back in the day, you know. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to be able to let him focus on one role. And so having him in closer in that role, you know, um, I think is really good. And with the way that the meta is and Hero Bulls is going to be, I'm confident having the Roush that we have because we have depth. We have if someone gets sick or something with travel, we have backups for that. Um, so the whole idea behind this was adaptable players being a, players that were comfortable talking about mistakes and adapting and improving and changing flexibility. Um, and so I feel like we accomplished that in building this roster. And just from the start, when we started back scrimming, which um, we officially started scrimming um, at, the, at the new year, mm -hmm. um, we had some a little stuff beforehand, some players did some stuff, whatever. But um, our official start was in January, and then when the, uh, all the players finally got their visas done and have been here, um, I mean, the growth has been crazy. It's super cool. I'm really excited. I don't, I don't want to, when people ask me how strong do, do you think Veal actually is, where do you rank you guys right now or whatever, I hate that question because I don't ever want to rank us like, I don't want to rank us high ever again. Managing expectations. Yeah, right? I want to manage expectations. You know, I think I learned that with Team USA. I don't want to rank us high. Like, I want to treat Please them. Please underestimate us, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm happy that teams are putting us at, like, you yeah. know, a lot of teams have us around 13, 14, 15. I'm in mean, the ranking. A lot of analysts, and I'm fine with that. I don't care. Preseason rankings. Like, Preseason rankings imagine. that, like, you know, it's, <laughs> well, I want to talk about that in a you second. You do? Okay. Yeah, a little bit. But, you know, I, I don't ever want to be in the mindset that I'm better than someone else because yeah. complacency. Yeah, because it's the idea of any given Sunday, like any weekend, 
any team can beat another team, especially with hero pools coming out. Yeah. Things are going to be super crazy and weird. So, um, you know, rankings or whatever, but I just want to focus on the next match. So even before hero pools came out, uh, there were two patches that were announced mm -hmm. and I'm pretty sure, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that the Overwatch League teams and staff weren't given advance notice of these patches, especially yeah. with it coming up to, again, homestands next weekend. Yeah. How's, in just this kind of last month leading up, there's been a lot of changes oh, yeah. both on patches and then there's this new hero pool thing announced. How's your stress level? <laughs> what's, your, what's your opinion on yeah. all these changes that have recently come through with the 1.44 patch and hero pools? Yeah. So my stress level actually is pretty good. Yeah? Yeah, because I feel like um, the structure that we've built, the players that we have, we can handle it. Mm -hmm. You know, we can handle a change and take it on the fly and be able to do it, um, which is, was the goal. So be, have, being able to do it so far has been good. Really happy with that. Um, but when we were practicing this one style and then suddenly patch hits and it's like, oh, there's these big changes. And then we get told, hey, you should play on this patch. It's probably going to be an Overwatch. It's okay. So now everything we worked on for two weeks, you know, it's like you take bits and pieces and, you know, move on. And then it completely changed one more time. So there was a lot of changes. And it was, you know, it, it's, it's frustrating to be working on something and set goals. And then suddenly it's just changed. All right. Yeah. Now this hero is like not useful. So we have to change everything. And just one hero pick changes everything about a comp. Um, and so then when hero pools got announced, that's going to be interesting. So with hero pools. OK, here we go. I like the idea of what they're trying to do. Yeah. I don't mind it. So forcing certain heroes to not be playable in a week does you know, kind of force the meta to change. Um, I don't know. We'll see how the aggressive patching goes, because I think that's the more important piece to that. Yeah. Because if it's just hero pools, then I think you're just going to be alternating metas. Like one week you're in one meta, now that that hero's playable, oh, right. now and you're back in this other one. Because the randomness is based on yeah. the playtime, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So um, right now, I think you're going to look at, you know, heroes like Mei are going to be, if, if you go off this initial patch, if something doesn't change, it would be every other week, teams are going to be playing Mei variations, you know? So we'll see how the aggressive patching idea um, works. The only thing that I, I really dislike is that it's a one week notice. Teams only get one week notice for what heroes are not playable in Overwatch League. Mm -hmm. So let's take the scenario where if the China trip had happened, we'd be notified one week before. Now we have to travel from Dallas to China. You're talking a day, a whole day of travel plus jet lag, and now we're in a foreign practice facility, and we're just touching the game, we have two days to learn. You also consider time zones. If a team's coming from, let's say, Seoul or China to the US, they get told on Monday, US time, well, it's Tuesday for them. So they lose a whole day of understanding, you know, of, of knowing what they're gonna play. Mm -hmm. um, and that changes a lot, so. I think that that just adds a lot of unnecessary stress. I'd like to see it be bi-weekly. Um, I think that you know, the difference between if a team were to get eight days of practice and another team gets six days of practice, that's less of a gap than three days to five days. You know, there's just so much that happens in the first five days that you know, I think every second is valuable. So when you introduce traveling to that, I think it's a lot of unnecessary stress. But it will test teams' flexibility, adaptability, and general strategy making. Mm -hmm. So um, that's all stuff that we had planned to do anyway. You know, should a patch hit, we'd be able to, you know, we'd be able to adapt quickly, which is why we built the coaching staff the roster the way we did. So I don't think it hurts us that much, um, but it's gonna be a lot more work. Yeah. <laughs> a lot more work for the coaches, you know. Do you think that it's gonna increase the importance of a strong coaching or staff for a team? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, absolutely. Do you have I, any kind of picks in your mind for which teams are going to be the most helped or most hurt by this change? That's a tough one. No, um, you want there, it to get into power rankings. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I'm not, because I don't know all, how all the coaches operate, it's yeah. really hard to, to say. Just based on last year, like, um, I'd be really interested to see how teams like London fare 
because, I mean, they have a large roster, but, you know, how adaptable are they actually? Do they, are they going to rely on other, other players to be able to play? Or are they going to be able to use the same core and just change the style? Mm-hmm. So you look at teams like Shock, for example. Shock, I think, is an extremely adaptable team, extremely flexible, like, and, I, you know, I don't think they're hurt at all. You know, they're, they're great. I think for us, like, I think it'll help us a lot. I'm not sure what teams are going to be hurt by it. I, I don't really want to dive too deep into that. Cause you don't want to flip that coin. It's mostly speculation. Um, but I know that there's, there's some teams that, you know, I think it's going to be totally fine for. Mm-hmm. So. so what did you want to talk about power rankings? All I was going to say was that um, there's a lot of, a lot of analysts and fans have, are completely wrong with some of their, with some of their power rankings. Completely wrong. I think it's universal that Shock is still the best team by far. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. There's a few that are, people are putting in the top ten that I don't know. I, I guess I don't really want to go too deep into it because I don't no. want to shit talk other teams or yeah, you know, yeah. I don't, you know exactly. And I don't want to rank us because uh, that that mindset not happening. Yeah, I, because I, I don't I don't want to put a. I don't want to think I'm better than any team. But by ranking Shock first, you're automatically you're ranking us not first. I'm excluding us from the conversation. Oh. Of the 19 teams. Of the Shock 19 teams in the Overwatch yes. League. <laughs> yeah. So I'm excited for Shock. I am excited for Gladiators and Soul. Yeah. Um, I am curious about Philly and Atlanta. Mm-hmm. Um, don't want to see how they grow and adapt. Yeah, because their style is not what I expected them to be, but they're—I think they're still, yeah. you know, solid teams. So we'll see. Um, but yeah. So going into this uh, this weekend, opening mm-hmm. weekend here, opening week, the two teams we're playing are the Valiant and the Shock, right? Correct. Mm-hmm. Looking forward to it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I Valiant has basically a whole new roster, um, and so we're trying to get any scouting information we can. With it being the first match, you have. You know, you kind of need to focus more on your own play mm-hmm. and, you know, your own team's understanding of what the current meta is. Um, so that's more what we're focusing on because we don't really have too much scouting info. Yeah. Um, but I'm pretty confident with where we're at right now. I think that we definitely have a good, you know, good chance on Valiant. And, the, I mean, the home crowd in Dallas is, is always <laughs> yeah. is so cool. It's, it's so great. And last year when Valiant was here, they got booed when they walked on stage. So. <laughs> Yeah, I'm hoping for the same thing. Don't let me down, fans. You know, <clears throat> so that'll be cool. And being able to play Shock the first week, yeah, I think is an interesting opportunity mm-hmm. because I think it really allows us to understand act where we like yeah. where we are, putting on the logical glasses where we actually are, mm-hmm. um, and what things we can improve on or whatever. You know, we have a lot of things. I do think Shock is beatable, um, but I don't want to think that. We can bet. Like I said, I don't want to think that we can just beat them. You know, I want to make sure that we're focused on. Yeah. You know, all the little things. And it is going to be extra challenge, extra challenging to play the shock this weekend, right? Because you play the valiant first, shock second. Mm-hmm. So shock will have a chance to look at and scout yeah. your stuff. Exactly. But it's going to be shock's first game. Yeah. So they're invisible. They team. they don't have to play on Saturday. They only play on Sunday. Yeah. Um, so it'll it's more of a disadvantage for us mm-hmm. because they get to do some scouting. And they get to rest. Mm-hmm. They get to rest too. Um, but at the same time, not that I'm making excuses. <laughs> yeah. At the same time, it's our home crowd, so we do have that advantage going for us. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited. I, I really want to see how we do. And how have you been enjoying the? Like, we're in one of the studios, but we're mm-hmm. right. Like, you locked, what, 50 feet from yeah. the training facility over into the studio, and you're going to mm-hmm. walk right to that back there afterwards. How are you enjoying the, yeah. the facilities here? I like it a lot. Yeah. It's a really cool atmosphere and environment. I mean. Um, one of the things that I've talked about in, in previous, previous like, stuff people ask me is like, I love being next to all of our other teams. Yeah. Even though sometimes it's loud, it'll be like interview and some, you know, yeah. the Counter-Strike team's yelling and scrims or whatever, that's fine. Because you're around people that are competitive. who are competitive and understand what you're going through. You know, even though it's a completely different game, they go through the same challenges. They go, you know, they understand the ups and downs. And so you have someone that you can talk to that's not in the Overwatch scene that understands what you're going through. I think that's super important for the players and staff. I mean, and we actually hang out with like the Counter Strike guys all the time. Yeah, you know, we, yeah, we do. And we, you know, we'll go out. To, we'll either get dinner or you know just go hang out or whatever. Um, and I think it's really cool, cool atmosphere, cool environment. We'll have our contenders team here too um, mm-hmm. soon. 
And so being able to have all of the teams here, the COD team, the Counter-Strike team, Contenders team, and the Overwatch League team uh, is really cool. It's such a cool dynamic that I can't like understate how much of a benefit it is for everyone. And then also just having the support of the staff. One of the challenges about being in LA was, you know, if we needed to talk to Hastro about something, you know, it was we had to call him or we had to, you know, right now we can just walk down and be like, Stro, this is something we need to talk about. Yeah. The league's asking us for this, like how do, you know, just the general being able to have everyone here is, is really cool. Plus it opens up so many more media opportunities. One of the things that I try to do is I really try to push our players to do media and content out, you know, out, outside of just playing the game because, yeah. um, you know, I think it's important to plan for your future. And there's no reason, you know, there's no reason not to get more popular. If, if, if you can handle all the challenges that come with being popular, I mean, you know, um, but I, I really want to help players with their daily lives, and that's part of the structure we have here, why we have a, you know, a mental skills coach, a, a physical yeah. coach, all that kind of stuff is, you know, we're not just playing the game. We're building careers and building lives and all that kind of stuff. And being able to do all of that in one area, in one space, is really cool. It's such a cool opportunity. So I'm really happy with, with how we're structured it, with how we've structured it. I mean... I'm sure it's probably fun for you streaming and then you just hear us yelling and screaming in the background. It's nice. You know? It's actually really yeah. nice. I enjoy it. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, it's, it's a, we, we laugh a lot because like we'll be in review and you'll be streaming and you know, we'll hear you like, you know, doing your stream stuff and you we, we chuckle about it or whatever. Um, but it's cool. It's a really cool environment, cool atmosphere. So um, I think everyone's super happy about it. Now you mentioned uh, uh, Mike and Kyle, the uh, mental yeah. skills coach and the mm -hmm. physical trainer. How's it uh, working with those guys? It's great. I mean, they, um, Kyle is usually, he, he, <clears throat> let's start over there. It's, <laughs> um, actually, I'm going to take water. So okay. give me, yeah. like, just a second. Yes, I'm going to, not sponsored by Smart Water. So. No, we should be. Hey, anybody out there, any water companies want to sponsor my podcast? Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. No, but it's, um, so it's great working with those guys. I mean, you know, Kyle is working with all the, well, they're both working with all, with all the teams, so. Um, but, you know, Kyle is doing a lot of just physical training sessions. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just about, like, you know, trying to get the guys to be jacked. It's like, yeah. you know, we, we want them just to have a healthy lifestyle. And, you know, doing a lot of uh, fitness just in general helps, helps you wake up, helps you think, helps, you know, mm -hmm. helps everything. Um, so all of our staff and all of our players get to do training sessions with him. Um, and then Mike sits in on our scrims every day. He's in our, he's in our coaches meeting and our team meetings and he, he does that for all the other teams too and yeah. just bounces around all the time. But um, it's really, it's nice to know that my players have someone like to talk to that's not just coaching staff. Yeah. Um, because, you know, they, of course they can talk to me and, and I do have a lot of like one-on-one -on -one talks about stuff with players, but um, it's just when it's a third party that is trustworthy and has training and like, you know, it's yeah. just, it's another tool for the players to really help, you know, help their mental state. And it's yeah. a lot of, it's a lot of pressure um, on players to do what we do and staff. And, you know, to be able to have him here every day, if a player is like struggling or something um, and he notices it, he'll like pull him aside and, you know, they, they go get coffee and talk and like, you know, it's a really cool thing. And to be able to have him, um, and, you know, in general, I, I bounce a lot of ideas off of him, too. You know, I'll pull him aside. He's a like, smart hey. guy. Yeah, I'll be like, hey, what do you think about doing this? It's what I think. Um, and he, you know, he was a college football player, and he worked with, you know, trained under the Dallas Mavericks sports psychologist and worked, you know, he's a very smart dude. And it's really cool to be able to talk about my philosophy and stuff with him. So uh, really excited for the support that they provide. Mike is, he's a pretty cool dude. He's well, got to be like 6'2", 6'3". Yeah. He's a big guy. But Tall dude, big I, beard. He sits in the training facility. He sits right by kind of that entrance. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, and we were joking that he's kind of like the bouncer. Yeah. Is that when scrims are going on, there's just this like massive football player mm -hmm. who anybody tries to go into that room and yeah. get something from players. Mike's like, <laughs> how can I help yeah. you? Just like really just imposing, like, like Stop get somewhere. away from my player. <laughs> so he kind of makes yeah. that the, the safe space for competition. Yeah. He cares a lot. Like, he cares a lot. Mm -hmm. Super smart, super yeah. knowledgeable guy. Yeah, I'm really happy to have him uh, yeah. working with our guys. I mean, that was a lot of the stuff last year. A lot of that stuff was remote. Yeah. Um, so being able to have it in person now is really cool. And I think it helps a lot. So 
really excited. Awesome. Excited to see how it goes. Anything else you wanted to chat about? Um, how's it going with you, though? All this Facebook. isn't about. This isn't about I know. Me. Come on no. now. No. I'll have to do the thing where uh, the next podcast, I'll just sit here and ask myself questions and go. switch chairs. Yeah, just go back and forth. Now we're going to keep this one focused on you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, overall, I think, you know, life in Dallas is good. Yeah. The team's going really well. It's, it's a lot of work, but it's my favorite thing to do. So um, I'm just excited. Just awesome. happy. I think Overwatch is in a, is in a unique state right now. Yeah. Um, and, you know. Is I'm, that a euphemism? No. <laughs> 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 Just a thought. I don't know. Okay. Um, I, I'm very positive about the future of Overwatch. Yeah. So I know Nick, that. What do you think about the transition from Twitch to YouTube gaming? We'll see. We'll see. I mean, supposedly the YouTube viewership was really good last year. Yeah. I um, mean, the, the Call of Duty World League there yeah. I hit 100,000 viewers mm -hmm. on its opening weekend. So. Yeah. So I, I, I don't think it's any reason for doom and gloom. Mm -hmm. um, even I know a lot of people were worried because a lot of some of the casters were leaving, you know, yeah. and there was some criticism on the Overwatch League um, staff. But I think I mean that's natural. I think that happens everywhere. It went right, went through it. You know, I mean, everyone, every league will go through stuff like that. And I think that the viewership in the West is high enough, but also there's a really big fan base in China, mm -hmm. which I think a lot of the West. It's kind of secluded from, doesn't realize how big of a, a casual fan base there is both here and how big of a casual fan base there is in China. Um, <clears throat> that a lot of the comments we see, the voices that are super negative, yeah. are, you know. I still remember the one time that we had, uh, it was a media briefing or something like mm -hmm. that with the Overwatch League there. Yeah. And uh, they were talking in the statistic about, like, you know, the competitive Overwatch yeah, yeah. subreddit or something, or like that loose collection of opinion havers right mm -hmm. you know they are like less than one half of one percent of the viewership yeah. of the overwatch league exactly like that one particular group might be really angry all of the time <laughs> but especially in overwatch yeah. there's a large amount of kind of casual viewers and this is a question that i wanted to um, ask you but i kind of we moved a bit too fast there oh. um with kind of the hero pools and stuff mm -hmm. there's the talk about i think it was poco who said yeah. that uh, poco and neptuno i think had both mentioned that it was going to be lowering kind of the skill level, which is, yeah. it's, that's just a guarantee. It's mm -hmm. going to happen, yep. right? If you're changing, making that many changes and people are forcing to adapt, right? You know, you're going to be playing at a lower level. Um, how much do you think that the casual viewer base or even really the, you know, the, the kind of elite group that we're talking about, the, the hardcore group, how much do you think that they actually understand competitive Overwatch? I don't think they do. Yeah? I don't think they really understand it that much at all. There's a lot of little things that happen yeah. that not even the, the analysts and desk gets to really cover. There's yeah. so many little things that um, with hero pools, I think you're going to be focused a lot more on um, the base, the floor, yeah. the skill level, yeah. um, rather than like how high can someone go yeah. with, with this one particular um, Do you think hero. it's going to dumb it down closer to a level where the casual view will be able yes. to understand? Yeah, it will. That, that's why I think it's a... I'm very understanding about the change because it's going to be a lot more about the basic combos and basic stuff that these compositions it'll can put together. It'll make the league more accessible yeah, despite being less competitive. Exactly. Yeah. So a, a lot of the um, unique things that you would see as like as a coach, how teams tweak their style over week over week, yeah. just isn't going to be there. It's going to be you know the how I think it's going to be more about teams using their base strengths with whatever heroes they have available. So it's going to be more about just like basic fundamental stuff in Overwatch, mm -hmm. um, which I think will be way easier for fans to understand or yeah. just casual viewers. Because when you have someone who hasn't watched Overwatch at all, um, I don't think people realize you know, how much finesse there is in, oh, yes. in positioning your flex support and where, you know, what rotations they take. Where Or just rollouts on cough maps. Yeah, exactly. Like There's so many little optimizations that happen that, you know, I mean, I, I love working on, but at the same time, like, um, I know that a lot of the fans don't, won't really appreciate that because they don't understand what it is. And yeah. like, I don't blame them. If you're not playing the game, you know, or working with the game 10 hours a day, you'll you It's probably always one of the things that. that I talk about when I do my content. Like I've, I've not exactly been quiet about the fact that when I do educational content yeah. on my streams or my uh, YouTube channel or anything like that, the content there is primarily based around, um, 
like the the platinum and yeah. the diamond level gameplay. Like even when I review a grandmaster footage, you know, we try and focus on kind of like large scale conceptual yeah, yeah. things or like paradigm shifts mm -hmm. to be more competitive things like that. But that's not at all what professional coaching is. And, yeah, you know, it's very a different. lot of a lot of people who uh, have been trying to make kind of pro level coaching content, you know. Even if they succeed and make pro-level coaching content, then it's therefore boring and has a really tiny audience. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah. no, I think it will be very, very interesting to see the. Uh, hopefully, at least, have the league be a little bit more understandable, yeah. just because it is kind of a lower level of gameplay, which is an interesting. You could argue whether that's good or bad. You know, yeah. the, we'll we'll but save that conversation. I, I, for a I think time. the the reach of like what is the yeah. truly competitive stuff is. Yeah. Um, it, it's still big enough for like, what am I trying to say? If if the content that you're going to be pushing for with the casual viewer base with hero pools, mm -hmm. the 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 dumber the dumbed down version stuff is still a lot for a lot of the casual fan base to grasp. Yes. Um, so you know, even though you're not going to the top shelf to grab like you know this little piece of content, um, there's still enough that's within reach there that I think will help the fan base. What do you think is the most important factor for an Overwatch League team success that is completely invisible to uh, you know, the casual viewer or maybe the hardcore viewer as well? What's the, what's the most important variable that most people have zero idea exists? Zero idea? Hmm. I would say how important it is to like how to, how to punish enemy cooldown usage. Because there's so many things that you'll see some player use a cooldown mm -hmm. and you don't understand why they use it when it has a very specific purpose. So, you know, in GOATS, for example, if you're using your bubble and pushing, your, your goal is to get out some cooldown so that you can then make a play off the team not having that cooldown um, and then you have like some plan devised around that. So a lot of the meta right now, mm -hmm. um, and I'll give a little taste, um, is Ooh. around, yeah, <laughs> is around whichever style of teams are running, you want to try to use some, you want to use some cooldown to get a different cooldown, whether that's Maywall, Baptiste Lamp, or Anna Grenade, or Speed Boost, and you have things that if I need the, two more heroes for a full composition. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and if the enemy doesn't have that cooldown, there's some way that you can take advantage of it. So mm -hmm. a lot, but a lot of times, if the enemy recognizes that you're trying to get cooldown, trading a specific cooldown for a specific cooldown, they'll have an answer to that. Mm -hmm. So a lot of fans or people that don't understand how all the trades work, mm -hmm. they'll be like, okay, I don't understand why he just used that and it doesn't really make sense. Like, this guy's dumb, this guy sucks, like why would he do that? Mm -hmm. When in reality, it's like a player or a team committing to making a, using a specific cooldown to try and get another cooldown to make a play that they've already talked about in advance to be able to you know, win the next fight. So whether that's, like I said, Baptiste Lamp, Lucio Speed Boost, Anna Grenade, you know, Arisa Pull, whatever, anything. There's you know, any number of cooldowns on Heroes. So very minute things that a lot of people probably wouldn't think about is how, how teams trade cooldowns. So. I'm out of questions. There you go. Good luck this weekend. Yeah, thank you very I'll be much. I know everybody yeah. else will be as well. Yeah, it'll be fun. So yeah. It'll be fun. I'm excited. Ho I'm hoping to do more of these as well. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure how it's gonna work with the Korean players. I won't, probably won't start eventually. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm not gonna learn Korean. Maybe get Deer in yeah. here to translate okay. or, but uh, yeah, yeah. probably next one I'm gonna do is with Dylan. He wants to do a lot more okay. content as well. Yeah. And, you know, especially with uh, him being the veteran, and I think it, I do think it's a really good idea to have a lot of the pros kind of working towards a larger media presence, yeah. or at least more accessible. You know, there's, um, it, directly engaging with the community can be really rough for people, especially yeah. if the team goes through a losing streak. Oh yeah. Completely theoretically, no experience, uh, personally, at all. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I've I would never, I don't never know been there, so I don't never know. Been there. I've never experienced a losing streak. <laughs> But uh, no, I still think that it's important for fans to kind of get insight into the team yeah. as well as, uh, you know, when you're talking about uh, Doha's uniqueness as a player, mm -hmm. you know, Crimzo, both of us know he's really silly, but really hardworking and smart mm -hmm. and adaptable guy. You know, these are the kind of things that I want to invite people in to yeah. see in a way that, you know, the players themselves can remain focused. You know, come mm -hmm. in here for an hour or so. It's cool. Talk and yeah, and it's cool because this is like a safe environment yeah. where players can talk about stuff, but not 
be concerned that someone's going to set them up, you know? Yeah. And I think it's a really cool opportunity. You so. know, we get so much warning about the press, right? It's like the yeah. press are never your friend. Nothing yeah. is off the record. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, this way pre recorded and we can edit out all the things like the uh, mm -hmm. announcement of Crimzo, <laughs> right? There you go. Hey. If, if it the gets thing, yeah. delayed, you know, yeah, we'll just, edit we'll that just out. announce it this way. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. thanks for coming on. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, I have you back after you uh, won the first after, couple games after and you're on a 10 game winning streak. Yeah. There you go. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Enjoy.